All right, I think we're ready to go then here. So we're here to talk about CCIE or Python, right? So it's an exciting session. I know I'm also standing between you guys and here, more or less. So we're going to try to get through this. I know it's a pretty controversial talk, but whatnot. One second. There we go. So the, the world of networking, right, we're all very familiar with 6100, CCNA, CCMP, uh, the typical certification track of networking, right? It's all very well understood. We know this stuff. This is how the networks operate, right? Um, so if you want to go become a professional, there's a very well thought out track, right? You go get your CCNA, you go get a CCMP, and then one day you go get your CCIE, right? It's all very well understood. The problem is with this new stuff that's coming out, you know, SDN, OpenFlow, you know, we're all told it's the future, it's the next great thing, Python, 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 right? Um, so how does that interact with what we know? Is that going to replace what we do or, you know, how does that interact? So the problem is we've, there's limited time, right? So the, the, the session that we're really talking about here is more about, okay, if you're, if you're looking at a certification or if you're looking at, it's not even just about certification, just what do you want to focus your time on? Should you be focusing on the traditional networking aspects that we all know, or should you have to go learn the program? Uh, and that's, there's not a lot of advice out there. So I deal a lot with uh, people that have this question, and I feel like it's something we need to talk about as an industry, right? So we're going to talk about, like, how do we, sorry? OK. Yeah, that's, that's a lot better. All right, great. So. Um, Let's talk about you know, exactly what is SDN and what's out there, and how does it interact, uh, and start to get our kind of guideposts about what's going on. And then from there, we'll talk about you know, what, what's the good part of some of this Python and programmability aspects that are coming out. And from there, you know, uh, take a look at what ex still exists from the networking world that's going to be really important. So here's the, uh, here's the disclaimer. So, uh, this is all, you're in the DevNet zone, obviously, right? So this is a little bit biased against uh, programming and those kinds of things. That shouldn't be much of a surprise. Uh, it's also a single perspective, right? So I'll tell you a little bit about myself, so my perspective, you understand a little bit more. So I've been doing this stuff since I was a teenager, right? I, I've known Cisco forever. Uh, CCNA, CCMP, CCI, I, I wore the CCI hat, intentionally not because I'm a fan of fedoras, but because I want to make sure everyone knows I got I got my love for the CCIEs out there. How many of you guys are CCIEs? Yeah, a lot. How many of you guys know Python or consider yourself a programmer? All right, a lot of both, right? That's great news. So, you know, where I came from is, you know, I went to school for computer science, so I did a little programming. I made the active decision not to go be a programmer, right? How many of you guys are in that boat? How many of you just decided not to be a programmer on purpose? Right, a lot of those people too. Uh, so. And then after that, after I, I went into TAC, I started doing voice over IP work, right? Your phone system broke, you called, I did that kind of stuff. Um, you know, route switch, CCIE at the, about, about the same time. Um, and I came out to the field, I was a sales engineer uh, for my customers, you know, building and architecting networks, those kinds of things. And about two years ago, I was like, you know what? I kind of got bit by the SDN bug. You know, I really started spending a lot of my time going back, learning how to program a bit, and start learning some of the terms that were out there and trying to make sense of what was happening. And it's been a lot of fun. So I'm a traditional network kind of guy that's now gone down the route of you know, becoming more SDN-like. So now I'm a, a solutions architect on the 9K and ACI team. So pretty much what I do every day is talk about programming and APIs and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it, it's, for the purposes of this presentation as well, you can basically more or less assume that, that Python is you know, open source or programming. So you can replace those words almost interchangeably for the purpose of this presentation. You know, Python's in the title, but that's not necessarily what we're explicitly talking about. So let's take a look a little bit like the history of, of networking, why I think this is a big deal, right? So you take a look at Cisco's roots. You know, we have gone out and picked a ton of fights with different industries, and we have made a lot of disruptions. You take a bit the, the big networking disruptions that, are, that have happened and take a look at them, right? So we've got you know, TCP IP. We said everything's going to be on the internet. Everything's going to be TCIP. And if you're not one of those protocols, you know, we did that. That was one of the first things that the Cisco did, right? From there, we took on you know, the Nortels and Avias of the world. We said, we're going to take your voice systems, your PRIs, and all that kind of stuff, your big iron kind of PBXs, 
and we're going to take it on our phone system. We're going to put it on IP, right? This is a big transition. This is what I spent a lot of my time doing, right? And what those guys say, they're like, you're never going to get you know, a reliable phone system on your network, right? How's that going to work? You guys can't keep that stuff up. The internet always goes down, and you want to put the, you know, the, the one thing in the system that can't go down, you can't la leave dial tone. You, you just, you're not allowed to do that. You'll never get it working, right? It's too different. It's not stable enough, right? If you think those same statements, you know, think, think through those, that's a lot of what we're saying today about SDN, right? We're saying, you'll never get, you know, my network, you know, into programmers' hands because they, their code is too unstable and they don't know what they're doing and they're going to make it all crash because I get Windows crashes all the time and, you know, things like getting AV to work are really hard and you'll never get it to work on this, these types of things, right? Uh, what we did, right? And now look at those companies. And also from the perspective of the guys that were, you know, the guys that were doing the punch down cables and that guys that were running these TDM phone systems, if you told them, you know, hey, you really should go learn DHCP and IP and MAC and switching and all this kind of stuff. And they go, well, what does that have to do with my wires? What does it do with my PBX? I'm not going to go learn that stuff, right? It sounds a lot like us saying, like, why would I go learn about, you know, test-driven development or Python or uh, some of these new programming methods or JavaScript frameworks? Why would I ever go learn that as a network guy? It has nothing to do with my TCP IP, right? So that's a little lesson from the past that we've seen of the, dis the difference between being the disruptor and being the disruptee, if those are even words, right? So when you're on the kind of receiving end of this abstraction pack, man, then you're not in, in good shape here. So, you know, we did this a few more times, right? We did it on Fiber Channel, and that was a big thing for us. Oh, now we have to go learn Fiber Channel or Ethernet. That was a problem. We did, it, we did servers, right? We managed to put servers more or less connected directly to the switch with, with UCS. And over time, the networking industry has gotten larger and larger and larger. But what's happened now is the software world has come over and started picking a fight with us, right? So this, is, this explains a lot of why this, I think this disruption is the largest one we've seen and why it explains why it's a little bit different than saying, oh, well, we, you know, we went through the inflection points with voice or IP or we went through the inflection points whenever we did FCOE and some of these kinds of things because we're not picking this fight, right? We didn't go out and say, we want to go put our networks on software, right? Even the word software-defined networking is a little hostile because they're saying that they define our network, right? So let's take a look at the mechanics of, of the software world a little bit and see how this is going to work. So, you know, this isn't their first rodeo. I mean, these guys have disrupted almost every major industry, right? They can take whatever you do and turn it into an HTML5 app, right? Whether you're a retail or whatever you're trying to do. So think about, again, uh, I don't know how many of you guys do like collaboration, for instance. We were selling, you know, $10,000, $100,000 video systems, and now with WebRTC, it's just a web page, right? You can fit what used to be an expensive video conferencing solution on a web page, right? Those same things are going to get reduced down into the network, right? Our network configuration, our world could be an HTML5 app at some point, right? Take a look at AWS, right? Um, but so it's good news and bad news. Good news is it's very powerful because they have a lot of tool sets, a lot of people that know how to do this stuff. They have a lot of frameworks. They have a lot of things figured out so they can quickly kind of steamroll and keep moving on to new and new and better things, right? So that's the bad news is that there's a lot of things out there to learn. The good news is we can use those things for our own purposes to make networks better. So I'd say I don't really like the word SDN. I think it's a little silly. I, I think it's kind of more interesting to think about it as a software influence networking, right? So we take some of the good parts of software and we influence the network and then we get to make funny puns about sending and those kinds of things because uh, it all s feels very foreign. Um, but some of the things we can directly get from them is like, for instance, how many of you guys test every single change you make before you make it in production? Right? You know, we don't. And how many, if you ask the software guys if they do that, almost, I wouldn't say all the changes go through, you know, testing, but they have a whole process of QA and all these kinds of things, right? So I think, you know, that's a really thing we can do kind of a short term to start getting some of the influence from the software world, right? And there's a lot more. You know, the, like I said, the tool sets, the, the whole don't repeat yourself methodologies, the the collaboration, the versioning, there's a lot of things they do and they do it right and we can use a lot of these things. So we take a look at high level, right, of, okay, well, maybe I don't, I'm not really built into this. I'm, I'm not really bought into this concept. But you can say, all right, well, 
what's really driving this? What's driving programmability? In my mind, it's, you know, companies need to move fast. We've heard that over and over again. You know, uh, Chambers, you know, the keynote, kept hitting on that, that point of we need to be fast. But, um, you know, IT is no longer a monopoly. It used to be that if the, the VP of marketing wanted an application, you know, in two weeks, you know, and they say, IT, we need it in two weeks. So they go, sorry, we're busy. We're fighting fires. We can get it to maybe like eight or nine. And then maybe the, the VP you know, talks to CIO or something like that, and they make an agreement, and they're like, okay, well, we can get you in six. You know, that's the best we can possibly do. Um, well, now that's not really the case, right? If IT's taking too long, they're like, okay, well, we're gonna take our stuff to the cloud. Sorry, right? If you're not moving fast enough, there's competition. IT's no longer a monopoly of those services, and someone else can do those things. Um, so let's take a look a little bit of what's, you know, then as IT people, we're like, why do you need like two minutes? Like, just wait, like two weeks, what's the big deal, right? So let's take a look a bit, let's get in the head of these people thinking like this and take a look a little bit at history, right? So if you take a look back to like 2001, that's when Agile and extreme programming kind of came out. You go back, you know, maybe 10 years from now, you know, that's when AWS launched and we started seeing the first kind of platform as a service and the application world start coming out. At that same time, that's whenever we started doing, you know, I, I really consider virtualization have really taken off whenever the Intel VT stuff came out. And virtualization got real serious. And that was 2006. Uh, the whole concept of DevOps, whether you're familiar with that or not, uh, that was in 2008, right? So that was, you know, eight years ago we've, they started doing these kinds of things. Uh, and when you start taking a look at what's happening in the application world, the pace of change that they're going in, where they're pushing code changes and making, doing everything every two weeks or days or pushing to production you know, hundreds of times a day and whatnot, and you know, w what do we have in the infrastructure world to help out with that, right? Converged infrastructure helps, but if you can stack it up against all the stuff the application guys are looking at, it doesn't really keep up. So let's, let's do some myths, right? There's a whole bunch of questions out there I ask or answer all the time, right? The first one is, do I need to become a programmer, right? Um, and we'll take a look at some of the other questions as well. So let's, if we dig into here, uh, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of John Willis. He, he, he basically said that we need to be able to speak multiple languages when we start doing these things, right? So the, the, the analogy I like to use with people and seems appropriately appropriate right now, which is if you're going to go to Mexico for spring break, you know, you don't need to learn Spanish. Right? If you do go down there, if you want to learn a few key, you want to learn a few key phrases, right? Maybe you want to learn how to say, you know, uno cerveza mas, or uno mas cerveza por favor, right? That's a very useful phrase in Mexico, right? That's going to get you places. Um, but you don't need to become fluent. If you become fluent, you're probably going to have a really good time. But you don't need to become fluent to do that. You need to learn the critical stuff on how to talk to people, right? Now everyone says, oh, we're going to network, we're going to automate our network Networks away, right? We're not going to have jobs. Well, if you're the one doing the automating, you're going to be worth a lot. You're not going to be, that's not going to be your problem. Um, but if you take a look at like the DevOps guys and some of the, what they've done in like sysadmin and cloud, there's still plenty of jobs for sysadmins. It's just that over time, you just may become less relevant, right? Even today, you can go get a job punching down cables for some TDM network someplace. It's just not a very important job or not very, you know, sexy at all. This is my favorite one. Someone asked me the other day, they're like, is this IPv6 all over again? And I apologize to anyone that's a big IPv6 fan. I think it is important now, but it's the classic case of crying wolf for, you know, 10 years. So everyone's like, do I really have to do this now or can I wait longer? And again, I think if you go back to the fact that the guys that are the software people in, in theory that are, you know, disrupting the network, there's a lot more to the software than there is to infrastructure, sadly, right? So I think it's going to take longer for us to learn those concepts, and we need to start getting prepared and getting ready earlier as opposed to later. So the, another one is, you know, hey, which book should I read to go learn SDN? Or can you teach me the SDN, right? Or can you define SDN for me? Is there a definition I should use, right? Uh, it doesn't really exist. Um, you can't just, it's not like politics or religion and, and things. You can't just put on layer eight of the OSI model, right? And some people say, well, SDN is, uh, you know, data plane, control plane separation, and, and that's what I need to learn, right? I need to go download OpenFlow. And you're like, that's not really true either, right? Uh, so we'll, 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 let's get into the software side of things a little bit, right? So when you start getting into software, and you start learning some of these terms, you start getting in there, you start reading about it, and it gets pretty overwhelming, right? You go in there, you start learning about Git, and, you know, pushes and pulls and clones, and you find out there's this cool framework, and you find out, 
oh, I, this integrates with OpenStack, and there's this project, and you know, you get a little bit deeper in there, you learn some more words, and you know, you start really getting, you think you get a feel for it, and you do a little more reading, and I mean, you're just like, like, when does this thing stop, right? And so most people are just, they don't, they kind of glaze over. They don't know exactly what to do with this, right? They're just like, you know, they're like, oh wow, SDN's cool, uh, not for me, right? Uh, so we'll try to kind of kind of tailor it down a little bit and, and talk about how you can start to put some of these words in some buckets and start getting your head around, you know, uh, whether or not these different projects are for you or not. So down at the, the lowest layer, you basically got like device layer stuff. So you've got, this thing work, it doesn't really work up here. So uh, in the hardware, you've got things working on, from, all the way from the ASIC level, there's people building programmable ASICs that will work with SDN. There's people doing CPU, like CPU instruction set abstraction so you can build uh, basically functions and things like that better on those CPUs. Uh, there's people building just chassis uh, with merchant silicon to do SDN. There's people uh, building just network operating systems to do that. Within the network operating system, there, there's features people are doing. So there's, you know, like Cisco, for instance, we're putting the Bash shell on like the Nexus 9000. That's kind of SDN-ish. We're calling it that anyways. There's uh, Python on a lot of the devices built in, especially if there's the Bash shell. And then once you go up northbound a little bit, you get into the API layers, right? So, you know, SSH, SNMP are kind of the standard today, but there's a lot of other things that are coming out, right? There's agents, there's a lot of REST. You see REST on everything. And then, um, then you get to the kind of the, this green layer. This is where the cool stuff happens, right? This is where the, the controllers are at. This is where uh, there's a lot of different buckets of things going on. So if you start kind of on the left over here, there's OpenFlow controllers, right? So there's Open Daylight, there's a Cisco Open SDN controller, uh, there's about 50-ish open source SDN controllers. I think most people are kind of going towards Open Daylight, so those, some of those open daylight, or sort of the open source controllers are starting to consolidate a little bit. You can do the configuration management side of things, right? All the Puppet, the Chef, the Ansible's, the Salts, uh, those guys all do mostly kind of like a DevOps tool set kind of thing where they do sys sysadmin for mostly, you know, Linux virtual machines is the main use case. But now as our devices start to become more and more of like a Linux machine and less like a actual discrete device, those tools start to become more relevant. You've also got the orchest orchestration stacks, right? So the, the open stacks, cloud stacks, uh, UCS Director, some of the VMware tools, they're all orchestrators that kind of get thrown into this as well because then maybe those are SDN, right? So each one of these so far could be considered SDN to, based on some loose marketing principle. There's the, the policy management side of things, right? So the stuff we're doing with uh, APIC, APIC EM, and the group-based policy with OpenStack uh, is, is a lot more policy-oriented than it is any of the others. And these are all like basically generic made-up things that are just trying to organize it, right? And in a year or two, we might have a number of different uh, boxes that we need to put up there because this is all a very rapidly changing space. And again, everything cool has an API on it, so all the controllers that are using APIs have APIs themselves. We call those the northbound APIs. The southbound APIs are mostly for command and control kind of operations, but also read, write. And then north of the APIs, that's where all the applications live, right? So there's people creating applications just for the, the, the network, right? And, that, and that's now technically SDN. Um, and then that's where like, you know, maybe you write your scripts or the, a lot of the GUIs are actually subscribers to their own APIs. Uh, and that gives you kind of a, an idea of, of where things are at and where they're sitting, right? You think so anyways. So if you zoom out just a little bit, you find out, you're like, well, Nick, uh, I see that you got uh, automation software up there on the top, but there's also automation software in the screen layer. And you're absolutely right because people stack this stuff together, right? So you can do some real silly stuff, and this is where it gets kind of complicated to understand, is because you start doing stuff like, well, OpenStack's kind of hard to set up. I wish I had an easier way to do that. You know what we could do is we could use OpenStack to deploy that, right? And that's actually the thing. People do that. It's called OpenStack on OpenStack, or triple O, right? And this is where like, the whole circular logic of SDN gets into. They're like, well, this is a uh, orchestrator for our SDN policy controller, which allows you to automate and orchestrate your policy for your network controller. And you're just like, does that actually make sense? Right? And that's why it's really hard to kind of get into this world of SDN, because there's a lot of people that talk like that. And if you're not kind of savvy with the terms, then it doesn't really mean anything to you. So what, what is worth learning, right? 
these I've kind of boiled it down to about six major things, right? And these aren't like you need to become an expert in these things, but you should become conversational, right? So, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to to dig into each one of these, but it is a fairly good list, right? So, you know, go learn some Python, go do Python the hard way, go maybe do Cor uh, Code Academy, uh, Linux Basics, maybe just load up a, a Linux VM and just start doing it for some day-to-day -day stuff. Just learn how to get around, do some network and file system kind of operations. Uh, REST APIs, I think, since you can more or less consider them the next type of CLI, that's what's gonna be doing the changes in your environment. They're worth learning because we all know the first rule of networking, right? If it's in my network, it's going to break. And so you wanna know how these work so when they break, you'll, you can understand how to fix it. Uh, Git and GitHub are interesting because one, it gives you an idea of how developers work and give an idea of their workflow, right? So if, if some develop, developer goes, well, we merged that into the, the, you know, the master branch and pulled it from GitHub so that you know, it's, it's updated, right? You want to make sure that those types of things make sense, but also because there's a lot of tools out on GitHub that you'll want to use for uh, different networking tools, right? So most of the open source stuff is all moved to GitHub. DevOps is up there because, you know, in terms of actually getting these changes into the network, at least when I go talk to people, I'm like, hey, I can come in, I can set up an orchestration engine and get you doing cool network automation in a couple of days, maybe less, right? And then it takes six months, a year, never, for people to actually use that because people are like, well, it doesn't interact with our change control. We just can't do that, right? And so I think the DevOps guys have some really interesting stories and, and principles around how to, how to make those changes in an organization, how to convince people, and, and what that looks like. And they also have some pretty cool tool sets to learn from. And you know, like I said, OpenStack, it, there's a lot of ways you can kind of break it apart, use it for multiple things. Um, you know, like for instance, in the Virtual Internet Routing Lab, Viral, it's a, it's a you know, component that's used in that or architecture. So it's interesting to, to know how that works so that you can use it in other ways. That's a bummer. So, uh, and then I put a list up here of basically some, you know, depending upon whether you're a service provider, enterprise, or a cloud focus, uh, some of these concepts that are, you know, will be a little more applicable to your environment. And these slides will be available later and whatnot. So you say, okay, how, how do I go learn all this stuff? Uh, the good thing is, you know, in the world of open source, they have a culture of sharing, right? So there's an excess of information out there in terms of uh, blog posts and podcasts and uh, you know, free books and just open source materials all over the place to learn these things. So it's really more of a matter of, of, of time and patience and playing with it. And trying to implement it in your day-to-day -day life more and more is a great way to learn it as well. Um, I also did put together some kind of, because there's an excess of information, I tried to curate the list down a little bit. It's at this uh, cs.co slash SDN fundamentals. So if we take a look at some of the big opportunities we have around integrating software into the network, maybe the, the software influence network and send kind of stuff, right? Um, is, you know, the versioning, right? Doing iOS controls, you know? Um, infrastructure as code, trying to figure out how we can start integrating our code and making our network changes more like code changes. You know, doing the testing, right? Making sure we don't test all of our stuff in production all the time, and maybe using things like Viral to do automated testing. They've got a nice, a lot of nice workflows, right, uh, on how to manage all these changes at scale. Um, and then there's also, like I said, they've got the software guys have figured out a lot of things, and they, they they have a lot of tools available, so we can start gluing things together, right? We can use their databases and their, uh, you know, message queues, and all these other things in the network to create kind of integrations and new products and whatnot. So if we go back and let's focus a little bit on the CCI REIT, right? I mean, uh, let's take a little, like the value of it, right? So who's got a CCI and is looking for a job and cannot find a job, right? <laughs> okay, recruiters, this guy over here. Um, so I mean, it's not like, you know, I, I get hit on LinkedIn all the time, you know, uh, CCI has a huge amount of value still. It's not going anywhere uh, and it's not being replaced, right? That's the truth. Um, and there's a ton of different you know, architectures there, right? You know, wireless, wireless guys are kind of laughing back. They're like, control plane, data plane separation. We've been doing that for a long time. You ever heard of lightweight access points? So, you know, maybe they'll get hit kind of with the SDN wave later, but SDN's coming to everything at some point. Um, 
And if you don't want to, like I said, well, a whole bunch of people raise their hands when they said, I chose not to program, right? And some of those people might say, okay, well, go for it. It might be kind of fun. Like, we're in this kind of fun stage of network programming that if you just glue some stuff together and you duct tape it and you're like, I posted co code to GitHub, people are like, oh, wow. You're, you're like, you really know what you're doing. And you, you, know, you go take a look at the code and you know, no one even knows if it's good code or not, but like, that guy is smart. He posts things to GitHub, right? So the, you know, the, the bar for you know, beginning a network programmer is pretty low right now. Um, so it's also good because these skills are highly reusable, right? So you can, if you learn them how to do it in one place, you'll end up using it somewhere else. And maybe you'll use it in your, your drone or your home automation at your own house um, or even someplace else. So we take a look at the, the knowledge that we get when we do these certifications and, and what's involved with networking. You know, there's probably more than one way to look at this, but, but one way to say is, you know, every time we make a configuration change, there's three major things we have to know, right? There's the, the, the intent or the business purpose for making that change, right? If you understand that and, and how it's architected and whatnot, uh, it's good to know. Um, you also have to know how that interacts with the rest of the network. You have to know the protocol knowledge, you have to know the dependencies, you have to know uh, whether it's supported or not, all those kinds of things. And then once those two are kind of figured out, then you go and do the implementation, right? You configure it and you memorize the CLI, and you know it from, from hard and conf T and you, know, you, you bang the commands in. Um, I think in the world of automation, that third part, the implementation, is the one that's probably gonna be less valuable, right? Because you know, once you put that into a, a Python script, some guy can just be like, I don't have to, have to remember how to do a VLAN change. I have a library that does that for me, and I just call that with, you know, um, you know add VLAN dot whatever, right? It's just a, it's, it's a single line of scripting. Uh, so knowing exactly why and how those things are at, that's, that's a lot of what the CCI is, right? All the protocols, all those things. I can tell you, the protocols aren't going away. Um, but if you're, you know, I think the place where the most risk of people, are like, not losing their jobs, but I would say losing relevance is probably in that, that lower level range of the certification track. That's the places, that, those are the places where we're gonna automate and start doing the easy stuff quickly and faster. And those are the places where, you know, if you're in that area, that's probably where you wanna make a decision of some sort. And the, the fun part is, is like, whenever we start talking about SDM, we, when we start talking about selling it, right, we give them this nice kind of thing on the left. We go, we have these overlay networks, and everyone has their own little network, and you, know, you can connect any layer two network anywhere in the network over layer three, and you know, developers can have their own VXLAN, their own kind of micro network to do these things, and it's really easy and nice, right? And then we do the, the VXLAN deep dive, right? And you're like, okay, well, technically, first we set up the layer three network, and then we do, we set up all the multicast routing, we want to make sure you got PIM running, uh, and on top of that, then we want to make sure that uh, we do BGP EVPN, so you got BGP peers over eBGP to do that. Uh, oh, by the way, there's tunnel interfaces everywhere, and everything works with, uh, you know, uh, route filtering and uh, all the typical routing switching stuff, and we're doing VRFs on top of that, right? So... <laughs> In a certain way, we're adding a lot more layers of abstraction to a lot of these kinds of you know, SDN concepts, but it's not making the network simpler by any means, right? So if you're actually able to troubleshoot all these things and configure all these things, you're going to become even more and more valuable, right? And there's going to be need to people to, to, to troubleshoot those things. Uh, there, are, there are some uh, certifications out there from the Learning at Cisco folks. They're down in World Solutions. Uh, they've got, I think, eight different certifications you can do. Some are based around uh, whether you're an engineer or more on the business side, more of a developer or more of an architect, right? So these are a good start from a Cisco perspective if you, if you want to go down the certification track. They haven't been formalized into a CCNA or CCMP kind of track yet, uh, but you can expect as the market starts to kind of consolidate and get a little more solid area around it that you'll start to see those kinds of things, right? One of the challenges though is the software world, they don't have meaningful certifications for the most part because they're so, it's so flexible, there's so many ways to do programming that it's not a very, very valuable way, right? So they might look at your past projects or they might look at your GitHub code, right? So you may want to start thinking about those kinds of things as well from a certification perspective. If you take a look at the different roles that are out here, uh, see if I can back this up a little bit. So if you take a look at the, these are the big kind of, I see big opportunities in the, the software world where we're going to need some more work and more people, right? Uh, 
the, the whole network program developer, who's going to write the scripts? You know, I don't know how many of you guys, you know, know application, how many of you guys know, know application people that know networks, right? <laughs> so, I mean, obviously there's a ton of value in creating network scripts and automating these things, and it's going to take a lot of work from both the network people and the automation people and the people that know how to write code to do this, right? So us as networkers are going to need to be able to talk to the developers who are writing these scripts. Or, uh, you know, a select few is even though you don't need to become a programmer, I think it's going to be a pretty, you know, opportunity-filled profession for people to do this. I don't think the, the job offers and um, job listings and, and whatnot have really caught up to the opportunity there. There's not really job listings right now for, you know, a network programmer, right? Or a network automation scripting tool. There's maybe one or two out there. For the most part, these kinds of operations are being done by like the, the more senior level network engineers, right? It's maybe if, if you want to be a network engineer five at some big company, you might need to know a little Python because the only people we trust to do these kinds of network automation things right now are the most senior people. And unfortunately, they're, they're no, that's not going to scale, right? So at some point, those people, the, the senior people, or in another session I call them the dinosaurs, are going to need to work with people that know how to program in order to create scripts that don't break the network, right? So there's going to be a lot of opportunity there to be that person, to be that liaison, or the person that develops those code and that, that script to do that. Uh, and th then you get into the whole automation concept. There's going to be a lot of requirements to create uh, automation sides, right? A lot of companies are starting to create their own kind of private clouds, and they need architects to do that. Uh, and then I put this, you know, basically organizational change agent, right? Like I said, trying to get automation into an environment, you know, Getting the tools set up and, and finding which tool set to use is not really the hard part. Getting the, convincing the change management people and the security people and uh, maybe even IT managing themselves that this is a good idea, that takes you know, a lot of effort and time. And people are going to need to be around to do that. And like, like I said, DevOps is a great place to start getting some of that, that knowledge. Uh, people have to train, sell this stuff. There's a lot of opportunities there. Um, and then there's the whole vendor side of things, right? Every vendor is trying to sell their latest SDN concept, and the whole understanding problem is one of the largest problems we have. Uh, and like I said, the network consulting is kind of being that consultant to the people to write the code. So we take a look at some of the roles and where they actually would maybe fit. And this is this is where that, that simplification danger comes in, right? So this is not by any means, uh, you know, the dictionary. But you know, I think a lot of network engineers are going to be able to be that consultant. I think. Like the architects might go and be more automation focused. The enterprise architects are probably going to do a little bit of everything. Um, IT management themselves, they have a real opportunity to start interacting with the, the DevOps community and, and start pushing the change into their own or organizations. The server and virtualization teams can start getting a little bit closer with the network people as well. And then if you're a developer and you actually learn networks, you're going to be very valuable as well. Um, and we take a look at the other side, and we say, okay, you don't have to do any of this. You don't have to learn any programming. You don't have to learn any, any of this stuff. There is more than enough room in the networking world to be just a really good network expert. You may want to learn a few things. I still recommend that. But there's enough problems with the network that we still need a lot of experts, right? Like I said, you know, there's not very many CCIEs out there looking for work right now. Um, it's still, still really highly sought after. If you get in the head of the network engineer and we say, okay, how do we figure out which one do I go? Where, where should I go? Uh, you might say, okay, well, I mean, do you have a developer background? Do you ever, do you ever write stuff? Have you ever written scripts? Do you know a little Perl? Do you know a little PHP? Uh, do you like doing this stuff? Do you like programming? If you hate Java exceptions and you hate pointer errors and you hate these things, you probably don't want to go do it. But if it's kind of fun for you and you like it, then it's, it's probably worth giving a look. Um, you know, if you're really close to your, your certification or you've been studying for a long time, go get it, right? I mean, that makes total sense. Um, like I said, the CCA is still very, very valuable, and a lot of these jobs don't quite exist yet. Uh, you also have to figure out, you know, how is it going to interact with your business, right? Are they going to support you? Are they going to support your concept that you're trying to do? Are they going to let you try to automate? Is it valuable for them to do that? Or is it more valuable for you to get better as a network engineer doing network, you know, protocols and whatnot? You know, if you're, like I said, home automation or if you're in Arduinos and the IoT kind of things, uh, it's kind of a nice way to, to work into that. 
Um, and you also have to figure out how, what, what extent you want to take this, right? Do you want to do it just for yourself? Do you just want to write a couple scripts for your own environment? Or do you want to go full bore and, you know, go start selling this to other people or start, you know, making this your, your entire career? And that's going to depend on, on which direction you should go as well. So if we back up here, kind of take high level, we would say that, you know, within the, the software and the Python open source communities, all these kinds of skill sets, there's a lot of opportunity. It's still not totally figured out, um, but there's a lot of culture change too, right? We, uh, you know, application people and network people really don't like each other. Uh, there's not very many shared uh, goals between those two organizations. So the more and more, the, the hardest part is maybe just getting over the hump of being like, maybe I have to tell those application guys they're right, or maybe I have to go interact with them, right? Um, that can be really painful, but it's something I think that needs to happen. Um, uh, the CCIE is going to continue to be highly valuable, right? Uh, that's, I don't think it was questioning that very much. Uh, but networks are complexifying, which is a word. I looked that up. Yeah. Uh, and you know the, the cop-out answer is do both, right? Go get your CCIE and then go learn to learn, learn Python as well. If you, if you know if the if you, you're the kind of guy that has that kind of time, then, then great, it's going to be awesome. Um, but we can't always guarantee that. I, you know, I tell this script, I tell this example in another place. I say, just get started. Just, just start doing something, right? You know, uh, if it feels like you can automate it, you should go try because uh, it's going to teach you a lot of mindset things that are very useful. So, for instance, uh, I was, I read, a, I was reading some stuff on the internet. I read a lot of cat articles and those kinds of things, and. Uh, there was this, this kind of joke article that said if the United States and uh, Canada, when they were playing for the Olympic hockey match, whoever loses has to take Justin Bieber, because apparently he's a, a Canadian citizen, but he lives in the United States, right? And at the same time, there was another article that said he was looking for a house in Atlanta, and I'm from Atlanta. I'm like, this isn't fair. I don't know. I don't, we don't have any hockey teams. I don't have a dog in this fight. So I was like, i got to figure out where we should send him if we do lose, because we're probably going to, and we did. Uh, so I went to the, the, the hockey the US hockey website, and I was going to say, okay, where are these guys from and which city they're in? And then I realized there's like 40 of them on the team. And I'm like, it's a lot of work to like count. I'm not going to get out like an Excel spreadsheet and start pacing stuff, which is what my first inclination was. I'm like, you know what? I, I start talking about this stuff all the time. I should actually do it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to write a program. So rather than taking the 30 seconds to put it into Excel and, and monkey around with it, I spent like 45 minutes you know, learning how to uh, do a, build a web scraper and then use that web, web scraper to uh, go pull those values and then a couple of different Python uh, you know, functions to, to then do a kind of accounting function of sorts. So you know, it, was, it was kind of fun. Um, it's totally silly. It has no real functional value. Um, but then, you know, I actually used those same, I actually used some of the same code to do other things, right? Uh, now, I, now I knew how to web script. Now I knew what some Python modules were. I had a little more experience, right? So us as network engineers, we're always like, does it scale? Is it perfect? Is, uh, how do you troubleshoot it? What's going to happen when it breaks? Uh, is this going to, you know, does it scale? Right? We always like that one. Um, so, you know, we have to be a little more open to do things that we're a little scared of, right? Even if it's useless, right? Or you think it's useless. There's a lot of value there. And because I was like, you know what? It's all open source, so I gave the code back to the community, right? So if, if anyone needs this code, you can go out to uh, GitHub on my, my uh, GitHub account uh, in case you want to see what a silly script looks like. Uh, and the answer is he's supposed to go to Minneapolis, by the way, in case any of you guys care about that. So if we take you know, a real big look on the way back, you know, we get way back. If there's only one thing you remember, it's, you know, that if you go to Mexico and you want a beer, it's, you know, uh, una mas cerveza, por favor, right? I mean, we just need to learn a little bit of things, and I think we can accomplish a lot, so. I'm imagining there's some questions, so. We've got questions. I'm going to take a beer break myself, actually. Yeah, this is the beeper app. What? Sorry. At all. Are you using beautiful soup. To yeah, I use beautiful soup. Yeah, I use awesome. beautiful soup to do the scraping. Questions on Python and CCIE. Yeah, back here. Um, if you're learning Python for the first time, should you start with? the version 2 of Python or version 3? Because I know there's more modules for 2, but 3, I hear, is the future. Yeah, I mean, 
I started with 2.7. And that's what I recommend, just because it's there's there's a lot more modules out there for it. You, there's there's some things you can run that will do you know two point seven to three conversions and whatnot. But at least for the time being, from my understanding and my experience, it seems easier to run stuff on two seven. Yeah, go ahead. So um, SSH module, I've been playing with that to get into the boxes, and yep. uh, it seems like there's a like a buffer overflow at some point. You can only pull so much, and then you know. Is there a way to change that in the library? The SSH module, which one? In Python? In so Python. So there's some other tools you can go use, um, like Paramico. It can, it can handle some of those kinds of things. Uh, there's also more and more APIs on our devices, right? So for instance, if it's a Nexus box, uh, NX API is available in 7.2 now, which kind of solves that problem as well, because that's now all, all over HTTP. Uh, so there's some more modern ways to do that, depending upon the box. Um, Actually, I had a question about that too. So, if we're to, I think it's that slide that has your, it has the SDN on top of SDN slide. Okay. And um, you see the rest up top. So, almost the interface, just the northbound application, it has the rest. But it sounds like that is also starting to hit southbound, right to the devices. Is that? Right? Yeah. So let me get back to that slide real quick. Just make sure. That's why it's. Okay. That here? Oop. Yeah, that's the one. So then you have REST up top there. Yep. And then down below we we have the Bash and the Python or or PK for example for an API library. But um, right now that's that's a state full connection, right? For the one PK, so the socket opens and the socket doesn't necessarily close after the execution. For one PK, yes. Yeah. So. I've heard there's this rumor that that rest, or, or from what I was hearing, like maybe that rest, that restful capacity is going to go southbound too to the devices. Is that for, a fair statement? Correct. I think I think if you're looking at one PK applications, you're probably it's probably worth your time to go investigate NetConf and Yang, you know, because it kind of goes out to try to accomplish a lot of the same things. And so then with NetConf itself, it's very similar to SSH, but there's also things like RestConf if you wanted to go down that route. So again, that is based on device availability. There's sometimes where uh, you know you have to use SSH, but if, if you're looking at 1PK, you're probably on some pretty modern code already. So it's worth seeing if you can't use some of the nut comp stuff instead. I think. So what would be your preferred method out of all those on the north, on the southbound? Uh, REST API, right? I mean, REST is HTTP. Everything supports HTTP. So whether you write C, whether you write PHP, whether you write JavaScript, whether you write Python, all those libraries have a very easy way to do HTTP. Okay. Right? And one last question, because I'm like hijacking the mic here. That's right. The uh, between Puppet and Chef, it seems last time I looked at Puppet, it seemed very limited on what you could do for an orchestration standpoint. Is Chef better? Which one would you prefer? So from a configuration management perspective, uh, they all have their pluses and minuses and whatnot. So I'm not going to try to you know, dissect which one's better for those kinds of things. From a network perspective, we're seeing uh, you know, Puppet's a little bit more dominant in the market, at least. Uh, but it's a totally different game for us in the networking world, because very, very few people are actually using those tools to manage networks. So it's kind of a open world for those, and they all have advantages and disadvantages. Like for instance, you know, uh, we've been doing a little bit of work with Ansible because they run an agentless uh, config, and because it's a, you know, there's a little bit of difficulty in running an agent on a network device, uh, we're, there's a little more flexibility sometimes to use Ansible there. So you know, if you're talking about just generic system management, um, you know, like Chef uses Ruby, so it's a little more programmable from what I understand. But some people like Puppet for some of the ways it works. So uh, I, you know, I think Puppet's around 60% something like that so they have the majority but that's not to say that they're the best solution so but if you're going to go try to learn something it seems like a good place to start as well so but Ansible's doing a lot of work at least on Nexus switches um, there's some good blog posts by guys like Jason Elements and all those guys questions Can you yep um, I missed the first part of the presentation, but uh, where as network engineers do you recommend us start as far as learning Python and just taking off with it? Yeah, I mean, um, the two big ones I, I recommend, like I said, if you just Google like learn Python, there's going to be like 10,000 articles on it. Um, what I recommend is 
depending upon your, your outlook, if you want something that's a little bit easier to get started with, you, you know, if you're the type of person that, like, if you run into your first roadblock and you quit, then Code Academy. Code Academy is great because like you just sign up for an account and then you just start programming. You don't have to download anything and it just kind of walks you through it, right? To me, like I said, I, I had a computer science background so I know how to program a bit. So, you know, it was a little slow pace for me, right? So I liked end up doing Python the hard way because I, I grew up doing like C and C++ and stuff. Um, so I know the, the programming concepts but I just don't know the, you know, the actual implementation inside of Python. So I did Python the hard way because it, you know, it gives you a little more room to make mistakes, right? It's, it's kind of like uh, when you do a lab and they give you all your step by step and tell you to exactly do this and then the lab works perfectly and every, everything runs and then your boss is like, so are you an expert on this stuff now? You're like, no, nothing broke, right? You know, uh, Python the hard way gives you a little more room to you know, play around and, and, and break things. But you know, they don't, it's not all in the web browser, it's not all ready for you. So I think it's a good place to start. And then on top of that, it's not just finding a place to go learn Python. There's a lot of people, I mean, how many, how many of you guys have gone to some type of Python course or started learning Python on the web of some sort, right? Yeah, pretty good amount. But then what, then what, right? That's the hard part. Once you learn Python, then what? Um, you know, I like NX API a lot because uh, I work a lot with Nexus boxes. But basically there's a sandbox where you log in, you can do a show command, it turns into JSON for you, then, then it sends that JSON to the switch, sends you back the JSON request that comes back from the, the router, and then you can click one button to get the Python code for that, right? And so I think that's a kind of a nice way to start using Python to some extent, right? You go, okay, well, all right, if I can get a show run, how hard is it to go get a show run from four of my switches and then save it, right? So I have to learn how to do a loop in Python, then I have to learn how to do file stuff in Python, and it's kind of a good way to start doing some use cases after you just start learning. So really long answer for your question, sorry. <laughs> I uh, just um, uh, wanted to ask, do you have any recommendations for managing iOS switches? Yeah, so for managing iOS right now, the, there's not a lot of protocols to do that. There is one called WSMA, W-S-M-A, Web Services Management Agent. Um, it's pretty old. It's not exactly modern or sexy at all. It uses, it's basically like uh, NetConf with some XML data and the, it's, it's not extremely well documented, but there's documentation out there if you really, really want to program something. A lot of the old Cisco GUIs used to use on the back end. Um, otherwise, you're looking at something like APIC EM, right? APIC EM is nice because they have what they call the service abstraction layer, or SAL. So they say we have this cool, this cool controller code, which would be kind of that, that green layer. And then southbound, their southbound SDN protocol is you know, SSH and CLI, right? But then as, as more protocols evolve on those types of platforms, you'll be able to plug that into something like 1PK or REST or something more modern. But for right now, for, for those types of switches, you're looking at APIC EM, I think. I've looked into um, Ansible and Paramico in the past to uh, manage iOS switches, and it doesn't seem to be many um, use cases out there or any examples. Do you know of any? We're working on that. That's one of the things that uh, We've got kind of initiative right now to put up all those places, put all the code and all these examples in one place. Because like if you go and look at like Puppet and Chef, they have these kind of marketplaces where you can go find examples, you can find scripts. Uh, we don't, we haven't quite developed that for the network yet. It's it's something we're working on. Um, you know, I run a users group, the network programmability users group. It's got this really ugly pug logo. You might have seen that. Um, so I'm trying to get it worked up through there as well. Uh, but it's, it's currently, a, yeah, it, it's an issue, uh, and we need to fix that. And there's a lot of scripts out there that do some cool things. They're just hard to discover sometimes. Yep. Questions? Questions, questions? Questions, questions? No? All right. Well, I will not hold you any longer. Go forth and conquer. <laughs>